And uh, I, I, I just echo what he said just a moment ago. It has been a joy to be here. And I said this morning, uh, my wife and I just feel like we're part of the family. And uh, uh, your pastor and his wife and, and, uh, and family have just been uh, encouraging to us and their spirit to serve the Lord. I, I'm, you know, I'm so thankful that uh, they've been here uh, these 30 plus years and laboring. And I tell you, that's, that's a rare thing. And this church is blessed to, uh, to have a pastor who's just stayed by the stuff. I thought, uh, I thought that I would do that in Mississippi. I was there 13 years and well on our way. And the, then the Lord just moved us. And so our family, um, we, uh, we started talking to the church in Colorado back in October. And uh, we were trying to get the door to close. And we, 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 tried, to get the, we tried to get the Lord to just shut that door. And uh, we began to realize very quickly that the Lord was doing something in our life and in that, in that uh, church. And so before we knew it, we were in the, we were in the middle of December and, uh, and we knew God was moving us from our family uh, there in, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And uh, we sold our house in Mississippi, bought a house in Colorado, resigned the church in Mississippi, and moved to a new church in 30 days. And uh, we, it was a whirlwind. And uh, all the emotions that go in that, it just hit us like a freight train. And I think when we pulled out of Mississippi, we cried all the way to Conway, Arkansas, and uh, just didn't really want to go. But we were following the Lord. It's interesting, you know, Pastor was talking about how every time you open the Bible, it's new and fresh. You know, this is, this is not just a book. This is a living book. That Bible's alive. This is the only book in the world that will talk to you when it's closed. You'll walk past it and it'll say, read me. Huh? Huh? You know what's interesting about the Bible? It's the only book that reads you while you're reading it. And uh, that's what's uh, great. And I want to just say, don't, don't just mark your Bible. Let your Bible mark you. Uh, I was reading, uh, I had studied, I was preaching in our church in Mississippi. I was preaching through the book of Hebrews, verse by verse by verse, and had been doing that for over a year. And, and you just can't plan this. Uh, humanly speaking, you cannot plan this. My wife and I had agreed with uh, the church in Colorado that we would come out there and talk to their pulpit committee. And, and the whole reason for us going out there was just to, for the Lord to shut the door on this. We thought maybe we could be an encouragement to them and help them, but uh, just, just shut the door because we, we have a great church. We're, we're where we want to be. And the next day, it was uh, November the 5th was the Monday, we were flying out to go to Denver, Colorado to meet with this pulpit committee. And on November the 4th, that Sunday night, I got in the pulpit, and uh, well, first of all, we had a missionary stop by that was unannounced, and it was a friend of mine from, uh, uh, from Tasmania, and I looked out in the crowd, and there he was, and I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I just stopped by, and I said, man, come lead us in prayer, give us a word, a testimony. He got up before the offering, and you know, missionaries, they don't just give a word of testimony, they got to preach for a while, okay? And uh, he made the statement, he said, you know, how beautiful Tasmania was, and how wonderful it, it is there. And he said, but that's not why we're there. Our home is in Indiana. He said, but, he said, God called us to Tasmania. And he said, I will tell you this, if you are not where God wants you to be, you get there as soon as you can. And when he said that, it was like the Holy Spirit just hit my heart. And I looked over at my wife and she was looking at me like with eyes like, did you just hear that? And so I just kind of dismissed it. And I said, no, Lord, I'm right where you want me to be, right? Because this is where I want to be. And then I got up to preach. And I said to the church, take your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 8. And that was where, I, where we were in our study. And I've had this message that I've prayed over. I have studied. I have prepared for months. And I get up behind the pulpit to preach it that night. And I said, look at this verse. By faith, Abraham when he was called to go into another country, obeyed. And it was like the Holy Spirit said, hey, uh, pastor, why don't you sit in the front row and I'm going to take over the message tonight, okay? And I just listened to this message on being obedient to the Lord. And the whole time I was preaching, my heart was just breaking because God was calling me to another place. And, uh, and so we've been there now for just over a month. 
And uh, we were looking forward. We had booked this, we had booked this, this trip to, to be in your youth conference back last year sometime and had no idea that we would be flying from Denver, Colorado to Honolulu. We thought we'd be coming from New Orleans to Honolulu. And so now, uh, but, but we realized that the Lord uh, had given us this opportunity to come and uh, to be a part of the youth conference and to be with Ohana Baptist Church and be refreshed in our spirit. And then we're going to be able to spend a couple of days and uh, really and truly, I, I'm, I'm just praying that my wife and I can be refreshed uh, in, our, in our bodies as well because we're tired and uh, we've moved and all the things that we've done. And it's just been refreshing to us and our spirit to be a part of what God's doing in Ohana. Look in Ephesians chapter 5, okay? Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, like, like uh, King Henry uh, VIII told his 12th wife, I won't keep you long. Okay? <laughs> so I won't keep you long. All God's people said, amen. All right? Amen. Uh, I, I just, by the way, I was wearing my Aloha shirt this morning, and I want to say it, it, uh, it was a very comfortable shirt. And then uh, uh, Pastor Andy got me this beautiful barong, and uh, I wore this over to the uh, Filipino chapel today. And uh, somebody said over there that I am so handsome that I make a barong, I make a barong look bright, all right, all right? So, anyway, so when I wear it, it's called a bright, all right? So, uh, <laughs> oh, man. Thank you, Pastor Caleb, for that. I appreciate it. Uh, I got to give, give credit where credit's due. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Everybody find that? Ephesians chapter 5. Look very carefully, if you will, please, uh, in Ephesians chapter 5. And look, if you will, in uh, verse number 17. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Uh, yesterday we were... Yesterday we were having a question and answer time with the teenagers and so often we get asked a question, uh, how do I know the will of God for my life? Well, well, listen, there, there are three great wills of God for every life in this room. First of all, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. God is not willing that anyone be lost. It is God's will that everyone be saved. And let me just tell you tonight, if you're not saved, if you're not born again, if you do not have Jesus Christ living in you, you are out of God's will. Uh, everyone that is in hell tonight is in hell out of God's will. Don't ever believe for a moment that God has uh, chosen them for hell. God is not willing that any should perish. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. God wants men saved. It is the will of God for you to be saved tonight. You might be thinking, well, I don't know that God can save me. God can save you, and God will save you if you'll humble yourself and come to Jesus Christ by faith. But then the Bible says, in our passage of Scripture that we're reading now, he says that um, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18 says, be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It is God's will for every man to be saved. And then it is God's will for every saved man to be filled with the Spirit. And then he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he said, uh, this is the will of God uh, concerning you, even your sanctification. It is God's will for every believer to be sanctified, to be set apart so that we can be used by the Master holy unto the Lord. Be ye holy as I am holy. Now listen, this is the great will of God for every life. That we be saved, that we be spirit filled, and that we be sanctified. If you're not saved tonight, you're out of God's will and you can be saved. Very simply. Uh, if you are saved but you're not spirit filled, you're out of God's will. And God cannot lead you beyond that unless we are spirit-filled. God said, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine when it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. I want to speak for just a few moments on, I think, that one of the greatest needs 
in the Christian church today. I think our Baptist churches need uh, a, new and, and a, a, a new understanding and a new uh, surrender to the filling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we need to be filled with the Spirit. I want you to ask yourself right now tonight, am I filled with the Spirit of God? Am I filled? Now, I want you to understand something. The, 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 uh, the, will of the, uh, the Spirit of God is not like some force or energy. Okay? The Spirit of God is a person. And, and you, uh, you're not just like a vessel and the, will and, and the Holy Spirit like a liquid. Uh, no, uh, you're a temple and He's a person. And He's to be able to fill the temple. Have you ever, you ever been at home and uh, you're just relaxing with the family? Got your shoes off, uh, feet propped up, eating a snack? And somebody knocks on the door, and you think, who's that? You run to the door, and, and, and lo and behold, some friends have stopped by. And you open the door, hey, what are you guys doing? Well, we're just in the area, thought we'd stop in. Okay, well, you're kind of giving the signal, everybody, pick up. <laughs> and you just, yeah, come in. And you just kind of let them into the front foyer of the house, you know, yeah, come on in. Good, we'll just stand right here and talk for a moment. <laughs> And then he's like, hey, I was just wondering, can I, can I use the restroom? No, you cannot. <laughs> well, why not? It's under construction. <laughs> it's being remodeled. Everything that was in our living room is being jammed in there right now as we speak. You cannot go in there. Now, you know, you know what happened is you let them in the house. But you're not willing to let them fill the house. You see, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. He indwells you. He comes to live within you. And just because you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that you're filled with the Spirit. There are a lot of Christians that we, we, we want the Holy Spirit to come in. But we don't want Him to fill every part of our life. There's some areas we want for ourselves. Can you imagine if I went over to Pastor Surface's house? And he said, Brother Miller, why don't you and your wife come in and, hey, just y'all make yourself at home. And I say, really? Thank you. Yeah, 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 man, my casa, su casa, right? Mi casa, su casa. Come on in. This is your house. I mean, just make yourself at home. It's Ohana, your family. Well, thank you, Pastor Surface. He said, oh, you guys want something to drink? I said, yeah, I'll take some tea. Or, or better yet, get me some pog. And so Pastor Surface goes in the kitchen to pour me a glass of pog. And he comes back in and he said, uh, uh, Miss Miller, where's Brother Miller? And she's like, I don't know. He got up and walked out. And, you know, pretty soon you hear some clanking around in his bedroom. And I'm just going through the dresser drawers. <laughs> Pastor Surface, I didn't know that, uh, I didn't know that you wore this. I, I didn't know that you, man, listen, I'm going through these files over here. And this is your mortgage? <laughs> what? I mean... And he'd be like, what are you doing in here? Well, hey, you said I could make myself at home. You see, sometimes we, we say, make yourself at home. Just don't go through those drawers. Make yourself home. I had an uncle. My dad was not born as a miller. Uh, my dad was adopted as a miller. My dad was actually born as a Brzezinski. All right, I'm thankful he was adopted. <laughs> I don't even know how to spell Brzezinski. But my dad was adopted as a, as a miller, and, and later in life, it's a long story, I won't tell the whole thing, but later in life, my dad got reunited with the Brzezinski family. And uh, he had an uncle that was uh, considerably older, and uh, when my dad got reunited with him, my, my, uncle, uh, my uncle Butch, is that right, Uncle Butch, uh, was like 90 years old, and he traveled to my dad's house. He and his wife came to my dad's house. And uh, my dad heard some clamoring around in the, in the kitchen, and he went in there. And my dad's uncle, who he hardly knows, is standing in the pantry, and he's, he's pulling stuff out, and he looks at my dad. And my dad had all these microwave bags of popcorn, you know? And he goes, do you know that you have 27 bags of popcorn? <laughs> he was, like, counting the spoons. Like, he, he was going through, like, he would just go through drawers, my dad said it was the most uncomfortable thing. You just walk into a room and there is his uncle. He's got the drawers pulled out and he's just counting. Do you know that you have 75 pairs of socks? You know? And the thing is, is he would just go through the whole house and just look at everything. He was just a nosy little guy. And that makes us uncomfortable. 
And when the Bible says be filled with the Spirit, what he's saying is I want the Holy Spirit to be able to walk through every area of your life. Many of us have let him in. But if you let him fill the whole house, is he, is he able to go to the family room of your heart? Is he able to go to the entertainment room of your heart? Is the Holy Spirit allowed to go to the reading room? Is he allowed to go to the, is he allowed to, go to the friend room? To the relationship room? To the, to the game room? Is he allowed to go into every room of your life? That's what the Bible's saying. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, now listen, there, there's a great reason why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and the one, one great reason is out of obedience. It is the will of God that you be filled with the Spirit. And if we're not filled with the Spirit, we're in disobedience to God. You need to be filled with the Spirit of God to be in obedience to God. The second reason you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit is because of our obligations. Uh, think about this for a minute. Do you, do, you know, do you know all the things that we're required to do as a Christian? I mean, have you read the Bible? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my... I mean, do you know there's a lot of stuff that we're required to do as a Christian? And, and men, quite frankly, if we try to do it all, it'll wear us out. How many of you, how many of you remember back in the day when they, had, uh, when they had mopeds? Anybody remember a moped? A moped was like a, was like a little motorcycle, had a little motor on it, and it had pedals on it. So it was kind of a bicycle and, and motorcycle combined. It was more bicycle than motorcycle. Anybody remember mopeds? Anybody remember those? All right. Well, I, I had a friend in high school. His name was Carl. Carl. Carl used to ride our Sunday school buses to church, and he got saved, and he wanted to go to our Christian school. And he was a great kid. He just wasn't so bright. And that was a really polite thing to say. That's the right way to say it. But, but really and truly, Carl was just one of those kids that the lights were on and nobody was home. He, he was one of those kids that was a few French fries short of a Happy Meal. He, he was, his dipstick didn't touch the oil. His elevator didn't quite go to the top floor. You, you understand what I'm saying, right? He just, he was just not, he was just not, uh, I mean, Carl was just kind of a, he was just the goofiest kid. But he was so sincere. I mean, listen, this kid was sincere. I never forget, we, guys would get together in our, in our school and we would, we would play Monopoly. We just, we kind of have like a r long running game of Monopoly. It, it, we could last days. And here's the crazy thing, Pastor Surface, Carl always won at Monopoly, always. And I'm thinking, how does this guy who can't even tie his shoes properly, how does he win at Monopoly? But he always won. And one night, we were playing, and, I, and Carl kind of moved, and I saw under his pillow, there was a stash of cash. And I said, Carl, what's all that money? He said, don't touch that. I said, what is that? No wonder you're winning. He said, oh, that's not mine. I said, well, what is it then? He said, that's my tithe. I said, your tithe? He said, yeah, every time I pass go and collect $200, I put $20 over here to the Lord. Every time you land on my boardwalk and park place and pay me a thousand bucks, I put a hundred dollars over there for the Lord. I'm like, no wonder you own all the railroads. <laughs> no wonder you own all this stuff. I mean, I got over there, I got like whatever that yellow one is in the corner. I'm getting like 10 bucks every time you pass me. I'm going bankrupt. And Carl's got a stash of cash. He's tithing over there. But one day, Carl, Carl worked, and he worked his way through our Christian school, and man, Carl got himself a moped. And he loved that moped. And let me just tell you something. Every time you saw Carl, he'd just be pedaling that thing along. One day, my youth pastor and I, we were driving somewhere, and we were going down a big hill in Colorado Springs. We were going down this steep hill, and, and man, it was a steep hill going down, and it was a steep hill going back up the other side. And we're going down. And as we're starting to come back up the other side, my youth pastor is looking, and he, he said, hey, is that Carl? And sure enough, there's this guy on a moped, and he's just standing pedaling, and he's just sweating going up this hill. And we just drive by, and I mean, this guy is just straining to get this moped up the hill. The next day at school, my youth pastor and I go to him, and we're like, Carl, were you pedaling your moped up Union Boulevard yesterday? He said, yeah. He said, why were you doing that? Well, I had to go to work. No, no, I understand that you had to go to work, but why were you pedaling it up? 
Well, I didn't want to push it. <laughs> and my youth pastor said, but Carl, it's got a motor. He said, yeah, but it doesn't work. He said, what do you mean it doesn't work? He said, it doesn't work. My, my youth pastor said, have you, have you tried to get it started? Yeah, it doesn't work. So we went out there and we looked at it. My youth pastor looked at it and said, Carl, have, wh why, why doesn't it work? He said, I don't know. You push the button and it just doesn't work. And, he, and my youth pastor said, have you ever put gas in it? He said, what's that? <laughs> he said, you put gas in it. No, I haven't. Man, we put a little gas in that thing and it fired right up. <laughs> Listen, Carl never pedaled that thing again. <laughs> I mean, you just, you'd see Carl just going down the road, and he just, man, his feet sticking out, hair slicked back. He was the happiest moped guy in town. We always knew that Carl was riding his moped. He was so happy. He was so happy. He had bugs in his teeth all the time. He was just happy. And now here's the truth. That moped, that moped, it, it had the potential to be pedaled. But listen, when you needed it, it had the power to propel itself. And you know, God did not give you this wonderful thing called the Christian life. He did not give you all of this beautiful thing of a so great salvation and then tell you, here, push it. You know, there's so many Christians that are tired. We're weary. And it's a struggle to try to do right. And the reason for it is we're doing it in our own strength. And the Bible says you have, you have all these obligations as a Christian. And you cannot do it on your own. You need to be filled with the Spirit. God gave you this great salvation, but then He gave you the engine. And He's called the Holy Spirit who lives in you to empower you. Let, let me show you some of your obligations. Look at verse 19. Look at verse 19. He said, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look right here. Your first obligation as a Christian is to worship. God made you to worship Him. Worship comes from the old word, worthyship. It is that God is worthy of your praise and honor. God made you to glorify Him, to worship Him, that He would be honored and glorified in your life. And listen, we have an obligation to worship Him. But look, many Christians, we're not worshiping. Uh, many times we come to church and, and it's almost like we have to work really, really, really hard to get people to, to sing. We have to get people, we have to work everybody up. I mean, churches are, churches are right now, I mean, there are, there are conferences and books and, and web, uh, web, web casting and all these things trying to figure out ways to get our churches more lively and more excited. And listen, it's not that we're missing a band and it's not that we're missing a great choir and it's not that we're missing talented musicians. The truth of the matter is we're missing the whole Holy Spirit. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit. spirit and in truth. Listen very carefully. So many churches when it comes to worship, they've made worship a battleground. I mean, you get in churches and they're fighting over all the worship. I told you this morning about the lady who came to me and said, Pastor, I didn't like that song we sang today. And I said, well, quite frankly, we didn't sing it to you. We were singing that to the Lord. But man, people want to make a battleground out of worship. But then you go to other places and there are Christians who want to make worship a playground. I mean, anything goes. Man, if it feels good, do it. If it makes me happy, again, <laughs> it's not about you. You see, to God, worship is not a playground and worship is not a battleground. To God, worship is holy ground. It is where we come we bow before His majesty and His glory and we stand in awe of who He is and what He's done. One of the things I've appreciated about being at Ohana is Pastor Caleb taking time to explain some of the things that we're singing. So many times we just sing words and we don't think about what we're singing. But to call attention to the fact that we are coming before God to enter into His gates with thanksgiving. Come before His presence with singing. This is a wonderful opportunity. You have an obligation to worship God. And you cannot worship God apart from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings you into that place to worship Him.
be filled with the Spirit because you have an obligation of worship. In your worship life, you need the Holy Spirit. Look, let me show you. Let me hasten. Look at verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, what I'm about to tell you is not 2019 politically correct, but it's A.D. 33 biblically correct. We, we need the power of the Holy Spirit, not only in our worship life, but in our wedded life. Wives need to learn to submit to their husbands. As Christ also, uh, as the church is subjected to Christ. You know, sometimes we think of submission as being an inferiority. Submission is an inferiority. My wife doesn't submit to me because I'm superior and she's inferior. In fact, there are many ways that my wife is far superior than me. She's superior than me at being a woman. She is a much better woman than I am. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, listen, Jesus submitted himself to the Father. He wasn't inferior to the Father. He was equal to God. Thought it not robbery to be called equal with God, yet he submitted himself. Now, can I tell you something? Wives, there's no way a wife can do that apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse number 25. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Hey, wives, uh, husbands, you've got a responsibility and obligation in your wedded life to love your wife as Christ loved the church. Now, listen to me. If you're going to love your wife as Christ loved the church, it's going to have to be Christ loving her through you. If your goal is the love of Christ, then it's going to take Christ in you, which is done by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I've never, had a, I've never found a woman who had a problem with verse 22 who was married to a man who was doing verse 25. It's amazing when you have a man loving as Christ that you can have a wife submitting as the church. It's amazing how they go hand in hand. But can I tell you why we have, you know why in churches, I'm talking about among God's people, pastors are tired and weary because they're having to carry such a battle and a burden of marriage counseling. And to people who have a Bible in their hand, who have the Holy Spirit living within them, but they're at home warring when they should be at home loving but they're not doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. My wife needs me to be spirit-filled. I need her to be spirit-filled. Look at, look at chapter 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Hey, you know what, children? Children, you're to be obedient to your parents. You're to give honor to your parents. Well, how do we do that as children and teenagers? But by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not let you be a rebellious teenager. The Holy Spirit will not let you be a sassy child. The Holy Spirit will help you. The life of Christ in you will bring you into subjection to honor and love. Your, as Jesus Christ submitted to his father, the Holy Spirit will help you submit to your father and your mother. One of the most touching verses in all the Bible is when Jesus, the Bible says in Matthew, uh, in, I think in Luke, where Jesus went home. It was in Luke chapter 2. At the end of the chapter, Jesus went home with Joseph and Mary. And the Bible said, and he was subject unto them. The creator of the universe went home and became an obedient child to his earthly parents. You know, if you were filled with the Holy Spirit, you'd be an obedient child. You know, our wedded life, our home lives need the power of the Holy Spirit. Look what else the Bible says. Look at verse number five. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Not, he said, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about our work life. You know, the greatest mission field in all the world, 
It's not the Philippines. It's not Indonesia. It's not India. The greatest mission field in the world is where every Christian goes to work on Monday morning. Imagine if every Christian, listen, imagine if every Christian went to work and they went to work not for that boss, but they were going to go to work for that boss as though he were Jesus Christ. And they weren't going to do their job for eye service and to get a raise, but they were going to do it as it was unto the Lord. You know what I believe, Pastor Surface? I believe if more Christians went to work spirit-filled on Monday, more unsaved people would believe what you and I say on Sunday. I think it was Gandhi who said, I've read and studied all the religions of the world, and he said, the one that intrigues me the most is Christianity, and I would be a Christian, but for the Christians. He said, if you are redeemed, if you want me to believe in your Redeemer, you need to look a little more redeemed. You know what Gandhi came in contact with? Fleshly, carnal Christians. The Bible says when you go to work tomorrow morning, you need to go in the power of the Holy Spirit. That means that when you have an old disgruntled boss, you look at that boss and you say, I'm going to serve him like he's Jesus. <laughs> I'm going to be kind. I'm going to do good to them that despitefully use me. And, and God said, I want you servants, you employees, to go to work tomorrow and work like you are working for Jesus. Show up early. Work hard. Stay until the job's done. Do the extra mile. Man, when they leave, they ought to say, those people from Ohana, they are crazy, but I want more of them. Send some more. They ought to be calling. Employers ought to be calling pastor. Listen, if you've got people in your church that are looking for a job, send them my way. Those are the best workers I've got. Look what else he said. Verse number nine. And you masters... He spoke first to the employees. Now he's speaking to the employers. He said, and masters, do the same thing unto them. He said, I want you to treat them. He said, if, if I'm telling the employees to go to work and treat their bosses like they were Jesus, I want you bosses to treat your employees like they were Jesus. Forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. He said, hey, bosses, Go to work tomorrow and treat your employees fairly and justly and righteously. If you've got people that work under you, treat them like Christ treats you. You know what that's going to take? Holy Spirit filled. Holy Spirit filled. In our work life. Let me, let me hasten and give you this. Look at verse number 10. He said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know what he said? He said, you've got an obligation to war. We're at war. The Christian life is a battlefield. But it's not a battlefield that we're fighting for victory. And Brother Caleb talked about this earlier. It's a battlefield that we're fighting from victory. Jesus has already taken the hill. He has already set us in a place of victory. And he said, now, keep it. Stand fast in this place of victory and fight against the devil. Fight against his wiles. Watch for his tactics. He said, I want you to wage war. Listen, my battle is not with my wife. My battle is not with my, with my employees. My battle is not with my family. My battle is with Satan. My battle is a spiritual battle. I'm not wrestling flesh and blood. I'm wrestling against the devil. Now, the devil's going to make it look like it's my wife. And if he gets me attacking her, I'm not fighting him. And he said, I want, you to be in, I want you to be in the warfare. Hey, tomorrow when you go out and you go to work as a spirit-filled Christian, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So many Christians are casualties because we're going about this casually and not as a soldier of Jesus Christ. He said, I want you to be a good soldier and fight the good fight. We need to be spirit-filled because we're in a war. Now watch this. I like this one. Look down in verse number 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And as for me, 
Now remember, verse 18, he's still talking about the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Now watch what he says in verse 19. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may be open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Listen, you have an obligation as a Christian, not only in your worship, not only in your wedded life, not only in your work life, not only in your warfare that you are spiritual warfare, but you have an obligation as a Christian in your witness to be able to open your mouth boldly to give the gospel. You know, Pastor was talking about uh, this week is missions conference. I'm so excited for you to hear Brother Sisk. I love Brother Don Sisk. What a tremendous Christian man. He makes me want to be a better Christian. I get around him and I just get so much conviction in my heart. Like, man, I mean, I was praying with him one time. We were in the Philippines and we were in a hotel room praying. And I kind of had to peek and look around. I thought I, thought the, I was going to see the Lord in that room. He was talking to the Lord like he was there. And he was. He's a wonderful man. But you know what I found about Brother Sisk? Everywhere he goes, he wants to give somebody the gospel. He's a witness. You know why? He's spirit-filled. i got to be honest with you. Sometimes I get on an airplane to sit down, and the person sits down next to me, and the Holy Spirit said, witness to them. And I just reach in my briefcase, I get my earbuds out, and I put my earbuds in, and I get my... And I think, Lord, they're going to make fun of me or it's going to be uncomfortable. And the Holy Spirit said, witness to them. And I'll tell you something. I know when I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit. When I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit, I sit back in that chair and I listen to my tunes and I act like I'm taking a nap. But man, when I'm filled with the Spirit of God, you can't shut me up on that plane. Hey, listen, buddy. If this plane went down, do you know where you're going? <laughs> All the way to the crash site. That's where you're going. Man, listen, you know, many of us are afraid to witness. You know what we need? We need some holy boldness that we can open our mouth boldly to give the gospel. Now, let me give you this, and I'm done tonight. We need to be spirit-filled. Well, how do you get spirit-filled? Let's go back to verse 18, and we'll close with this. Understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Now, now, can I tell you, Paul was not even talking about alcohol here. He, that wasn't even in the discussion. So why did he throw this in? Through the Bible, through the New Testament, being filled with the Spirit was always equated with drunkenness. Remember back in Acts chapter 2 when the apostles were filled with the Spirit of God and they came out and began to preach and they said, man, these guys found some new wine. And Peter had to stand up and say, you men of Israel, hearken unto me. These men are not drunken as ye suppose. But this is what prophet Joel said when he said in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon you. He was making a contrast. Throughout the New Testament, there was always a contrast between drunkenness and being spirit filled. Let me just tell you something. Alcohol is the devil's cheap substitute for a spirit filled life. What do people do? They go to the bottle to forget their problems. They go to the bottle to cope with life. They go to the bottle to get their help and to, and to find their relaxation and their rest. But it's just a temporary solution. It, it promises a temporary heaven, but it leads to an everlasting hell. God was not giving us, you know, people have said this, well, look, I, I can drink some wine as long as it's not to excess. That's not what it said. It said, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. So if what I'm drinking has excess in it and can lead me to excess, I ought not to be drinking it. He said, you don't need that. You don't need that cheap substitute. You have the real thing. And he said, now listen, think about this. I'm contrasting drunkenness with being spirit-filled. How does a person get drunk? Well, they have to take a drink. I believe it's an old Japanese proverb, but if you're Japanese tonight and it's not one of your proverbs, let me know, because I keep saying this is a Japanese proverb. <laughs> It's an old Japanese proverb, I believe, that says, first a man takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the man. Now, how does a person get drunk? Well, first of all, he's got to yield himself to that drink and take it in. A, 
person's got to sit down and be willing to take it in. Jesus said in Luke chapter 11 and verse 13, if ye being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Have you asked the Holy Spirit to fill you today? Have you opened up the doors to your life and said, okay, now Lord, fill me. I'm taking you in. It's amazing. When a man starts to drink, he keeps drinking. And what happens? All of a sudden, uh, he starts talking funny. You know, it just, uh, uh, listen, I was just going to just have a little teensy weensy. Some of you say, man, pastor, how do you know how to do that? I have deacons. Uh, but a man, when he starts drinking, he starts talking funny. And then you know what he starts doing? He starts walking funny. You know, he's trying to go this way. But he's, he's walking funny. And you know what happens to a man who's been drinking? He starts singing. Oh, and he starts singing. I'll tell you what else they do. They get generous. And hey, let's give everybody one. Man, they get so loving. I was at a football game many years ago, and this guy was standing behind me, and he was a big old rough, tough guy. I mean, he's the kind of guy that, I mean, you, he would not give you a hug. He wouldn't touch you. He's just a big old tough guy. I didn't know him from Adam. He was standing behind me. But he started drinking. By the third quarter, the drink had taken the man. And let me tell you what happened to this guy. All of a sudden, past the surface, he was draped over the top of me. <laughs> and he was like, you have been such a good friend. <laughs> this is the best friend I've ever had. And I mean, he's just proclaiming to everybody how wonderful of a friend I've been. 30 seconds later, he had his shirt off and he was standing in the stairwell, totally making a fool of himself. A few minutes later, he was wanting to fight everybody that was coming at him. The ushers were coming up there and saying, sir, you need to get out of the stadium. And you know, I'll, I'll bust you. Listen, let me tell you, a guy gets drinking, the smallest guy in the whole place will walk up to the biggest guy. Man, I'll take him on. He gets bold. Now, what am I saying? What am I saying? A person getting drunk, he gets under the influence of another substance, and it changes his talk. It changes his walk. It changes his behavior. It changes everything about him. Why? Because he has surrendered to another substance. Now look at me. When the Holy Spirit comes into the believer, he begins to talk different. He begins to walk different. He begins to give differently. He gets bold. He's out of step with the world. He's out of tune with the world. He's got a different song in his heart. And what the Lord was saying is, look, look you don't need the cheap substitute. You've got the real thing. Be filled with the Spirit. How does a man get drunk? He's got to drink. How does he stay drunk? He's got to keep drinking. How does a Christian get filled with the Spirit of God? He goes to the Lord and he yields himself and he asks for the Holy Spirit. How does he stay filled? He continues to just keep himself yielded and open and asking. I want to challenge you tonight. Are you filled with the Spirit of God? Are you filled? Is he allowed in every room, in every nook, in every cranny, every closet, every corner, every dresser drawer? Is the Holy Spirit allowed in every area of your life? If not, why not? Tonight, why don't you just throw the doors open of your life and say, okay, Lord, here I am. Fill me with your Spirit. Lord, I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to be totally consumed by the Holy Spirit of God. I want to love my wife like Christ loves the church. I want to submit to my husband like the church is submitted to Christ. I want to witness. I want to, I want to go to work tomorrow filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm not, talking about going to the Holy, I'm not talking about going to work tomorrow and preaching a sermon. I'm talking about just going and being a good employee. Now, can I tell you where a lot of us are? God's given this wonderful thing called salvation. And we're pedaling as hard as we can to get it up the hill. And if we just stop and say, okay, Lord, fill me. Fill me. <laughs> Not by my might or my wisdom, but by thy spirit. 
Listen, you know what we need tonight? We need the Holy Spirit of God. My prayer for my life, my prayer for my family, my children, my prayer for my church at home, Front Range Baptist Church, my prayer for Ohana Baptist Church, is that we would be spirit-filled Christians. May God use us. May God use us to the fullest.